All right, needles and jelly spoons, we're on take number nine and my fifth iron brew and gin and whatever you want to call it, cursed combination. Um, on that note, uh, you're back on the honey again, but this time it appears you've woken up in a scrapyard. Curious indeed. You don't need anything from here, nor do you work here. Yet you feel drawn to go deeper into the abyss. The hours tick by and the sun starts to set, yet you feel compelled to carry on. You're getting close to something. You can feel its presence getting stronger by the minute as the sun begins to dip below the crimson horizon, your curiosity pounding throughout your body with every step that you take. Before long, you discover what appears to be an abandoned aircraft hangar, but confusion sets in as you realise you're nowhere near an airport or an airfield. Is this a warehouse, perhaps? No, it, it can't be. There's bits of airframe lying about. Bent prop blades, discarded wings, and landing gear assemblies lie about the hangar's perimeter. So you cautiously decide to go inside as the looming black clouds block out what remains of the twilight. It's dark and damp inside. You can barely see two feet in front of you. You fumble around for a light switch of some sort, making your way deeper into the void as you do. Then suddenly, something scurries across the loose hangar floor. You turn your head in the direction of the noise, but you can't see anything. You stand still for a second as a shiver runs down your spine. Silence. You continue making your way down the wall, but you hear it again. Again, your eyes follow the noise, and again you still can't see through the bleak darkness. But the noise, it starts up again. You freeze in fear as the scurrying gets louder and louder. You can hear it gunning for you along the loose floor from the other end of the hangar. You turn to run, but it's too late. For you, I've just got X-32s. Which is really ironic because it doesn't actually feature in this episode. Uh, and on that note, hello and welcome to my Ted Thymu Talk. Stealthy Rejects, Part 1, Season 1, Episode 4. I somehow managed to convince myself that it was Episode 5. I think it's because of the pilot episodes. It could equally also be because of the alcohol. Um, but as you can tell, I had originally intended this to be one long episode and then realised that it was going to be a long episode so i split it up into two parts um and then unfortunately in this instance the x32 doesn't actually feature but it'll feature in the next one speaking of the next one it's probably going to appear sometime next year it might appear before that but i don't have a crystal ball that allows me to look in the future to see when i'm going to get this done and my upload schedule is fucking god awful at the best of time so on that note Getting on with the presentation. A long, long time ago, somewhere in the early 1980s, America decided that the USSR was getting a little bit too close to them technologically for comfort. Following the USSR showing off their SU-27, look at that Cobra maneuver, and the MiG-29, America realised there was a chance that their beloved F-15 might not be enough to secure that tasty air dominance that they were so used to. So America decided to put the USSR in its place by starting the ATF program, or the Advanced Tactical Fornication, I mean, fighter program. Uh, this, of course, included the usual suspects, such as Boeing, General Dynamics, Lockheed, Northrop, and McDonnell Douglas, who in turn submitted some weird and wonderful concepts, half of which looked like they belong in a sci-fi film. However, in this instance, I would like you to pay particular attention to Lockheed's initial concept, which looks oddly familiar. I, I don't know why, I just can't seem to put my finger on it. Oh, wait, uh, no, uh, never mind, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I, I'm sure it's an original design that definitely wasn't based off one of their previous aircraft. Naturally, Lockheed made it into the finals of America's Got Talent and produced the YF-12, I mean uh, the, the YF-22, which in my opinion underwhelmingly looks nothing like the original concept. 
I feel like the US Air Force effectively got catfished. Oh, Lockheed Martin, you slimy bastards. Northrop, though, also made it in the finals with their design, and being the chance that they were stuck to their guns, if you ignore the fact that they produced three concepts. Three entirely different concepts at that. Um, and produced the YF-23, or rather they produced two of them, known as PAV-1, the one in black, and PAV-2, the one in grey. Now, initially I searched to find out what the definition of PAV meant, because uh, I didn't know, and Google very helpfully brought up concrete. <laughs> so, um, I had to do a bit more digging. Turns out it, it stands for prototype air vehicle. Now, I feel like it would have been a lot easier just to say prototype aircraft, but I realised that PA system might be a bit more awkward and more confusing, so maybe PAV is a good acronym in this instance. But PAV-2 was notably fitted with a new experimental variable cycle engine, which for those of you who don't know, means that the engine can vary how much air bypasses the core of the engine, increasing the efficiency of it at various different altitudes. To explain further, a turbojet is traditionally known for performing pretty well at low altitudes or in places where there's very thick, with two Cs, air density. Whereas a medium bypass or a high bypass engine perform better at higher altitudes. Bypass referring to, again, the amount of air that bypasses the core of the engine. So in a turbojet, all the air gets sucked into the combustion chamber and burned. In a high bypass engine, most of the air actually goes around the combustion, cha the combustion chamber. Uh, why... The US Air Force decided that they didn't want to go with the variable bypass engine is anyone's guess. I'm not really paid enough to investigate further. I mean, I do this for a hobby as opposed to you know anything else. But from memory, and again, this is temperamental at best. I would not go with anything I say as fact. Um, but it is my vague understanding that they didn't go with it on the premise that it was a new technology and they didn't really want to risk it. So they went with a more traditional engine. And thus, the variable bypass engine was postponed to a later date. I have a feeling it might be incorporated on the F-35 at some point, but uh, it's just me and my alcohol at the moment trying to work that one out. Now... Much to your disappointment, I'm not going to create a dramatic story on the competition between these two planes. We all know that Big Chungus on the right won, and became the F-22 Raptor that we know and love today. Or hate, if you're a degenerate old fart that's a member of the Reformers and or Fighter Mafia. I legitimately used to look up to these guys when I first started getting into aerospace. Um, and then I grew up and realised that actually they probably hindered the aerospace industry more than actually contributed to it. So I really want to raise the middle finger, but at the same time, really old guys, and I'd feel bad about doing that. So I will just pretend that I did it. But I digress. What I'm interested in, though, is why did the YF-23 lose? Well, it's definitely not because it looked bad. The YF-23 is considered by many, including myself, to be one of the nicest looking fighter aircraft in the world. I would quite happily have wet dreams over this plane. It is basically the equivalent, or the aircraft equivalent, of a swan. It is beautiful. It's a beautiful aircraft. Especially when you compare it to the YF-22, which basically looks like the fighter jet equivalent of a turtle trying to make a hasty retreat into its fucking shell. Um, legend has it that despite the YF-23 being stealthier and faster, the, F the YF-22 won because of its conventional design, its superior agility, and Northrop's issues with the B-2 Spirit program. And the YF-22 uh, had favourable adaptability for the naval variant, which allowed the YF-22 to win overall. But to me, something doesn't quite add up. Now, I'm not saying that these 
the issues, you know, contributed to the YF22 winning, but I don't think they're the whole picture. At least, not to the extent that Wikipedia would have you believe. And I say that for the following reasons. First of all, Jim Sandberg and Paul Metz both piloted the YF-23 and have testified, along with various Air Force uh, test pilots, that the YF-23 was a fantastic aircraft with excellent handling characteristics. And Paul Metz in particular is pretty significant here because not only did he fly the YF-23, but he also flew the F-22A, which was the production version, or the first production version, of the F-22. Now, to clarify, he didn't fly the YF-22, because at the time, obviously, it was a competition, and Paul worked for Northrop, and if he flew the YF-22, then he could have relayed information back to Northrop, and competition -y stuff, and secrets, and government, and uh, you get the idea. It wasn't allowed a big no-no, but by the time the competition was over, he was allowed to fly the F-22A. Or at least fly the test version of the F-22A. So, and with that in mind, um, during a presentation, I'll put a link in the description, he said the following. Never hang your head in shame about what we did. We built a tremendous product that would stand side by side with anything else, and in many cases exceed the capabilities of anything else. And we can always be proud of that. Of course, like I said before, it's worth noting... Uh, or bearing in mind that he worked for Northrop at the time of the competition. But as the only man that has piloted both aircraft, I think his stance shouldn't be completely disregarded. And I think it does play a part in why I think the YF-23 was ultimately shafted. The presentation also heavily implies that the agility of the aircraft was comparable to the YF-22, referring to its com comparatively huge and powerful control services. Now, in particular, those rear stabilizers, if you will. Um, I want to call them vertical stabilizers, but they're not because they're canted at something like a 45 degree angle. Uh, just to emphasize just how big these were, if you were to line them across along the same axis as the wing, they would have roughly the same width as the wing itself. That's how big they are, and they're driven by powerful motors as well on top of that so you've got a huge surface driven by powerful motors which means that if you want the aircraft to move in a direction you don't have to move the control surface that much in order for you to get the uh, aircraft input that you want so you can move the you can manipulate the aircraft along the longitudinal lateral and normal axis by quite a significant amount without actually moving the control surfaces that much. And so in that sense, the YF-23's agility was nothing to be sniffed at. It could do most of what the YF-22 could do, with the exception that the YF-22 had superior stall handling in the sense that it had fr thrust vectoring. But that's a very niche uh, flight envelope for a fighter aircraft to be in. Again, this isn't a stealth aircraft. It's supposed to be almost like a standoff weapon. You're supposed to use it at long ranges and use that stealth to the advantage. Um, so to expect this super maneuverability, like post-stall uh, characteristics or whatever, post-stall handling, is not really, I would have considered, a major requirement for something for the ATF program. And additionally, on top of that, Northrop had experience in producing modern stealth aircraft through the B-2 Spirit, along with all the problems that arose during its development. So they were not only experienced in producing all the stuff required for the stealth aircraft, but they were also aware of the problems that would arise during that development. And Lockheed, by contrast, well, unless you count this as a modern stealth aircraft, it didn't and history dictates that Lockheed had more than its fair share of problems producing the F-22 resulting in various delays and cost overruns. Oh gee who could have predicted that one? It's funny how history has a habit of reoccurring or reoccurring burdens fucking uh, something thoughtful here I don't know. You get the you get the idea though. 
And the naval argument doesn't really make much sense either, because the naval version of the F-22 was theorised to look like this, while the naval version of the F-23 was supposed to look like this. Oh, look, it's got canards. Excuse me while I go and suffer from PTSD from the last episode. Um, I would like to note that this is a concept stealth plane with canards, though. Uh, I'm going to take a deep breath now before I continue. Um, but essentially, the bottom line is, both aircraft would require extent an extensive redesign. The F-22 with the variable geometry wings and Northrop with the new flight surface layout. Guessing which one would be easier to make at this stage in the design would be a finger in the wind at best. Conventional design in doesn't really make sense either, for, because Lockheed's initial proposal was far from conventional. Uh, furthermore, this was the fucking ATF program, a program that was intended to push aircraft design to its absolute limits. We're talking about radar evasion, internal weapons base, super crews, that kind of thing. I mean, sure, some, these features could be applied on other aircraft, but this was the first time that they would all be bundled into one fighter jet. It just doesn't make sense to my smooth brain. So on that note, what do I think? Well, this next slide is a small portion of what I think, I must admit. I don't. It's definitely not the whole story, but I do think it is worth mentioning. I think the YF-23 got thrown to the curb a little bit for a few reasons. And firstly, I think Lockheed's PR strategy was superior. If you search for the YF-22, it doesn't take you long to find pictures of it flying at extreme angles and firing missiles. Or just doing things that you would expect from a typical fighter jet, to be honest. But by contrast, you probably won't find anything like that from the YF-23. But as we know, PR isn't really enough on its own to win a project of such a magnitude. On top of this, Lockheed was down on its luck. In an interview, John Shapek, a thermals engineer on the YF-23 program, believed it was in the national interest for Lockheed to win, as they had no new fighter programs at the time. By contrast, Northrop had participation with McDonnell Douglas in the FA-18, and was busy with the B-2 program. Moreover, the US government made it clear that this wasn't a fly-off competition implying it wasn't just a case of which aircraft had better flight performance. Now, I personally disagree with John's overall assessment. I don't think it's entirely because the US government wanted to keep the competition between the companies going. And with all the previous in mind, this is why I believe the YF-23 wasn't selected. It wasn't a case of competition or a case of bad management mishaps during the B-2 Spirit program, or because the YF-22 was inherently better. My belief is that it was a case of resources, or lack thereof. You see, Lockheed was simply better equipped to continue the program, because they were basically sat twiddling their thumbs with nothing to do, while Northrop had their resource fingers in other pies. It didn't make sense to give Northrop the contract when the YF-23 didn't present a significant enough advantage over the YF-22. Now, this isn't just me saying that the YF-23 was definitively better than the YF-22. I'm just explaining why the YF-22 made more sense to go with. In the end, the YF-23 wasn't selected not because it wasn't good, but because it wasn't good enough to justify the potential bottleneck in resources. Ironically, I believe it was Northrop's success in other programs that led the, to the demise of the YF-23. Of course, I could be wrong, but that's my Ted Tholomew thought. Join us next time, where we talk about the Chonks, the X-35 and the X-32. And on that note, I wish you all a fantastic Christmas. I hope you all get sufficiently drunk and eat lots of mince pies and cheese. And so, goodbye. Merry Christmas, and thanks for watching. And now I've got to find the stop record button, which is going to be fun.